Hey, WCC family, thanks again for being with us for WCC Online Church. We are so grateful and thankful uh, that we have the opportunity and that we have the technology to be able to share this time together. We're looking forward today uh, to singing songs of praise to our Lord. We're looking forward to open up God's Word. We're going to be in Acts chapter 4 again uh, this week, and towards the end of our service, we're going to share in a time of communion together. Happy Independence Day weekend. Thanks for being with us. This started with an idea. Somehow, if we were given the opportunity, we could become more. If given the place and the time, we could build a nation where everyone could become more. We prayed for favor. We believed that out of many, we could become one. Though America was never simple, our nation did not give in or give up. We crawled, strived for dreams and freedoms we believed in, fought to hold hands as we learned to stand on our own. We are brothers and sisters. Our dreams are not dimmed by our tears. We have stumbled but will not fall. It began with the idea that beliefs should not be dictated. Freedom was to be shared. Worship was the right of the individual, not the responsibility of the government. All of these things were self-evident. We knew it in our hearts. They were inalienable for everyone, endowed by our Creator, God-given. On this day, we remember our freedom, and we thank the God who provided it. May God bless America. Oh, mm -hmm. 
And um, he wanted to do a, a project, a research project based on NFL games. And he wanted to see if in NFL games, if referees could be uh, intimidated or if they could be persuaded by, you know, the coaches and the teams yelling at him on the sidelines. So he, he looked through research from, from five years worth of NFL games. And in particular, he looked at 1,400 plays uh, that took place near the sideline where uh, the referee on the sideline would be, uh, you know, have that team on that side sideline yelling in their ear. Well, what he found, uh, the, the evidence showed overwhelmingly was that uh, indeed uh, those referees could be persuaded. And that if there was a, what is, you know, a bang bang play on the sideline where the referee just has to make a judgment call in that moment, um, you know, that could go either way. He overwhelmingly chose to side with the, the team whose sideline he was closest to. Uh, in, in short, his findings said that in, intimidation works. Pressure the refs, get in their face, and they will often cave to social pressure. Well, today we're looking uh, at continuing our Unstoppable God series. And we're going to find today in, the, in Acts chapter 4 that there is a pressure that's going to be applied to the church. And there are much bigger stakes than just a, a football game. But it, we're going to find in Acts chapter 4 that there is a pressure that's being applied to the church. And, and we'll see here later, but in short, the pressure is to shut up about Jesus. And that is a pressure that though the circumstances for us are uh, a little bit different, uh, that is a pressure that still exists for us today. Um, Sarah and I have this thing where, um, 
You know, if we go to a, a social gathering or, you know, if we're meeting new people that, that don't know us, uh, we've got kind of this joke where we see, you know, we, we sometimes we see how quickly we can get into the fact that, that I'm a pastor and that she's a pastor's wife. And sometimes we, we, we play it like, well, how, how long can we stall before we let people know uh, that I'm a pastor or that she's a pastor's wife? Uh, because in social situations, it's, it's really <laughs> kind of funny. Uh, because, you know, they're, they're people and, you know, when you're meeting people, you know, you ask, you know, my, you know, where they might live, but, but pretty quickly you get to the, the, um, the question of, well, well, what do you do? And, you know, uh, there are many of you that are watching that aren't pastors. Uh, and so you give your answers and you talk a little bit about that. But uh, more often times than not, I tell people, you know, people ask me, well, what do you do? And I say, well, I'm a pastor. And they're, they just get, you know, a blank look on their face. And they might say, well, oh, oh, okay. Well, that's good. I think we want to go get some more punch. It's, it's nice, nice to meet you. Or, you know, Sarah might be having a good conversation with somebody that she's just met. And uh, they're talking about, about kids, about family. And then the topic comes up, well, what, what does your husband do? She says, well, my husband's a pastor. And sometimes that conversation just kind of shuts down real fast. And, um, you know, I, I can't imagine what's going on in people's minds. I can't put thoughts in their heads. But we do live in a culture, in a world where uh, it's Jesus just makes people uncomfortable. And we live in a world that says, you know what, uh, you should really keep your faith to yourself. I mean, you, you can believe what you want to believe, but certainly you need to just keep that in your own private world. You don't need to be talking about that. And so we, too, live with a, kind of an unspoken pressure to keep our faith to ourselves, to keep this Jesus stuff, you know, toned, toned down. Well, is that the right thing to do? Well, we're going to look in, in Acts chapter four. We're going to see how the church responded to the pressure that was put on them. Just to summarize and kind of get you, <clears throat> excuse me, caught up to where we're at in the story. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John were on their way to the temple. There is a lame man outside the temple begging for money. And God used them to do a miracle and to heal that man. And he went running into the temple, jumping and shouting and praising God. A crowd gathered and Peter began to preach to them a message about Jesus. A message that said, you know, repent and turn to Jesus. Turn away from your sins and turn to Jesus. Well, uh, we find in the early verses of Acts chapter 4 that they are sharing into the evening there and that the authorities don't like what's going on. And so they send what is called the temple guard to arrest Peter and John. And so they arrest them. But, but Acts chapter 4 verse 4 just captures this amazing scene. Uh, in Acts 3 it says they seized Peter and John because it was evening. They put them in jail until the next day. But in verse 4 it says, But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. Just imagine that scene. Peter and John are, are, are preaching a message. And in the middle of their message, uh, authorities come to arrest them and, and drag them off to prison. But as they're leaving, as they're being, you know, uh, dragged off, uh, they give some sort of invitation. You know, if you want this Jesus stuff, if you if you too want to risk being arrested, then respond. Turn away from your sin and turn to Jesus. And it says in verse four that five thousand men were added to the church that day. And we don't know how many women or, or how many uh, children were there hearing the message as well and, and responding to it. But 5,000 men responded to that message. That is just an incredible scene. Can you imagine watching, you know, uh, on television or, or being at, you know, one of those old Billy Graham crusades? But except the message coming to an end and, and Billy Graham giving an invitation and people coming uh, forward at the end of his invitation. Imagine if he's interrupted, uh, you know, towards the end of his sermon, he's dragged off in handcuffs. And as he's being dragged off, he yells and the microphone picks it up. Hey, if you want to respond to Jesus, if you want to trust him with your life, if you want to turn from your sin and turn to Jesus, then you come forward. And as he's being dragged off, 
Thousands of people come forward. It's just an incredible scene to imagine. Well, it says that the next day that the, they are brought before the Sanhedrin, which is basically a Jewish religious court. In the Jewish religious court, the Sanhedrin had the authority to arrest people, put people in jail, uh, to have them beaten, or, or, or even worse. And last week we looked at, at, at Peter and John before the Sanhedrin. They asked, you know, what, by what name or by what power did you do this miracle? And, and Peter boldly says, well, it's in the name of Jesus who you crucified, who you killed, that this man has been healed. And it says that, that the Sanhedrin uh, were, were astonished that, that Peter and, and John were unschooled and ordinary men. You know why? They, they weren't the best of the best. They, they didn't, you know, progress through rabbi school. They, they were sent off to, to learn the family trade. And so these unschooled, ordinary fishermen are just boldly proclaiming Jesus in their presence and not shrinking back at all. And it says that the, that the Sanhedrin was just astonished. And that they took note that these, that these men had been with Jesus. So as Acts chapter 4 kind of continues, the Sanhedrin sends John and Peter out to the hallway and they want to talk and, and, and discuss what has happened. And, you know, they're like, well, there's a miracle that's taking place, but these men can't keep preaching about this Jesus. So we're going to pick up the scene and we're really going to see the pressure applied in verse 18. Peter and John are brought back. You know, the Sanhedrin has, has talked and counseled with one another. And now they're being brought, Peter and John are being brought back in verse 18. It says, and they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, judge for yourself whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help but speaking about what we have seen and about what we have heard. You see, the pressure was put on. And how did they respond? When the pressure is put on us, how do we need to respond? Well, the first principle that we see this morning is that, is that the early church shared the message fearlessly. They shared the message fearlessly. You see, what's, what's happening this moment is huge. And it's really almost ironic because uh, they are the judges. They are in a religious court. And Peter and John get dragged before them and they're told, don't preach anymore in this name. And Peter responds... In verse 19, you know what? Look, we're in a court. Now you need to judge for yourself. Is it, is it right for us to obey you? Or is it right for us to obey God? <laughs> and he says, well, uh, we cannot help but speak about what we have seen and heard from this Jesus. It's an amazing scene. Peter, you know, I don't know if you, you catch the irony of that. They're in a courtroom. They're in the religious court. These people that they're seeing before are their judges. And Peter says, you know what? You're judges. You're smart. Judge for yourself. You're the judges, so you judge for yourself. Should we obey you or should we obey God? What is happening here uh, is really, really significant uh, because of two things as we kind of look into the past. The first thing that we see about this moment that is huge and about this moment that is significant is that Jesus is keeping a promise. Jesus is keeping his promise that he made to these uh, apostles earlier. We find in, in Luke chapter 12, verses 11 and 12, before he was ever arrested and put on trial, Jesus was with his disciples. And listen to what he said. He said, when you are brought before synagogues, rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. We're seeing here in this moment that this that this promise is being fulfilled. They have indeed been brought before the synagogues and rulers and authorities. And the Holy Spirit is giving them boldness. The Holy Spirit is giving them confidence. The Holy Spirit is giving them the words to say. We've seen Peter over and over again as you read the gospel, stick his foot in his mouth. But now he is eloquently, powerfully representing the church as its primary spokesman in these earliest days. Jesus is keeping his promise to them. Secondly, we see that Jesus is, is redeeming the past, specifically Peter's past. Because again, I don't know if you remember the story, but as Jesus was being arrested and brought to trial, Peter denied Jesus three times. 
And before he even did that, you know, earlier that night, he said, you know, you know what, Jesus, I want to follow you to the end. I won't let anything happen to you. And Peter called it, and Jesus called a shot and said, you know what, Peter, actually, before the night's over, you're going to uh, deny me three times. Before the rooster crows in the morning, you're going to deny me three times. And again, we look back and we see in the book of Luke, uh, verses 54 through 62, there's uh, this scene where Peter uh, somewhat spots him and says, you know, aren't you one of those guys? He says, no, I'm not one of those guys. The second person is like, you know what? Hey, I think you, aren't you one of Jesus' followers? And he denies it. And then finally, a third person says, you know what? Did, aren't you one of Jesus' people? Aren't you one of his followers? And in Luke 22, verse 60, he says, Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word that the Lord had spoken to him. And it says in verse 62 that, G, that, that Peter went outside and he wept bitterly. You see, in this moment before the Sanhedrin, in the scene that's taking place, Jesus is redeeming Peter's past. Jesus is giving Peter a, a doer, a doer. He's giving him a makeup test. The first time around, Peter failed the test. He caved to the pressure. And now the pressure isn't the same. Now the pressure's been multiplied. And he's standing before the Sanhedrin. He's standing before the authorities. And the pressure is mounting. The pressure is building. But this time, Peter passes the test. And instead of denying Jesus, he just boldly and fearlessly proclaims Jesus. This should be an encouragement to you. If you have ever thought that you weren't worthy to tell anybody about Jesus, if you have ever had that thought cross your mind, well, who am I to, to tell people about Jesus because of what I've done? Who am I because of my past? Who am I to tell anybody uh, what they should do with Jesus? Well, well be assured, be, be encouraged by this scene with Peter that your failures and your mistakes in the past don't disqualify you from sharing Jesus. If you've ever thought, oh God, give me a second chance. Oh God, please give me another chance. If you've ever prayed that kind of prayer, you should be encouraged by the scene that we're seeing right here because Peter gets his second chance. Peter gets a second try. Peter gets a redo. In this moment, Jesus is keeping his promise to them. Jesus is redeeming the past and they are fearlessly sharing the message. You know, in our day and time, things in, in you know, it's, it's Independence Day weekend. Things in our country are, are divided, to say the least. What, what, does our, what does our country need now? Well, it's the same thing our country has always needed. They need Jesus. What does our community need right now? Well, it's the same thing our community has always needed. We need Jesus. What does your family, what does your household need now? Well, it's the same thing you've always needed. You need Jesus. And we, the, the, the body of Christ, we, those who, who are followers of Jesus, we have the message. We have the hope uh, of the world to share. The country needs it. Our community needs it. Our, our families need it. We need Jesus. There's this verse in Jeremiah chapter 2. It's verse 13. Uh, and it says in Jeremiah 2, 13, I think it really captures uh, the essence of, of where we're at. He says that my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me the spring of living water. And have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. We live in a day and time where the world is digging their own cisterns. They, they beg and, and they, they, they need, they desperately cry out for their, their thirst to be satisfied. But they're digging their own wells. 
And they may produce a little bit of water for a little while, but time and time and time again, those cisterns run dry. We as believers in Christ have the, the, the spring of living water to share with people in Jesus Christ. And even though the world tells us, you know what, you should probably keep that to yourself. Or even though the world tells us, you know what, uh, you know, don't be pushing this Jesus stuff on me. We have the hope of the world to share. So we too need to choose, as Peter did and as John did, to fearlessly share the message. I mean, we, we all feel that pressure. We all feel, uh, you know, that pull that we, we all want to be liked. And that's certainly a normal thing to feel. Everybody wants to be liked. But if your desire to be liked uh, causes you to sell out on Jesus, then, then you haven't just got a desire. Then, then you've got an idol or you've got, you've got a God. A false God. There, there are a few verses in, in the Bible that, that really speak to this. In Romans 12, 2, it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This world has always sought to squeeze people into its mold. Proverbs 29, 25 says, Fear of man will prove to be a snare. Fear of man is a trap. Fear of man will prove, prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Uh, we all want to be liked, but fear of man is a snare. In John 12, verses 42 through 43, it talks about the leaders, the religious leaders. It says, at the same time, even among the leaders believed in Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. Verse 43 is very telling. For, for they loved human praise more than praise from God. We all want to be liked. But if we choose to fear men to the point that we sell out on Jesus, then we are compromising our faith. I, I heard a, pre, a, a pastor once uh, describe just how, how ridiculous that is with, with, with a picture. He said, you know, imagine how foolish it would be for someone to, to, to fear a kitten and just to be deathly terrified of a kitten, but to be fearless about walking up to a lion and punching it in the face. That's how ridiculous it is if we choose to fear men over fearing God, who's our creator, who's the all-powerful all creator of the world. And so Peter and John made that choice. They would not uh, cave to the pressure that they would continue to share Jesus fearlessly and faithfully. The second thing we see at how the early church responded to the pressure in this text is we see that they that they fervently prayed. They, they prayed fervently. It says after uh, after Peter and John speak to them, the, the, the council uh, threatened them more in verse 21 after further threats. We don't know exactly what those threats are, but, you know, they they piled some stuff on. If you continue to do this, you're going to regret it. Stop preaching the name of Jesus or else. And so they, they decided to release them and let them go. In verse 23, Peter and John go back to the church and are sharing uh, what, what they were told. They're sharing the, the demands that, that the religious leaders had placed on them. And how do you think they responded? How do you think they responded to the threats? How do you think they responded to the pressure? Well, we've seen that, that with the church in the book of Acts, that the prayers, the muscle memory that they turn to time and time again. But they went to prayer. But before we look at their prayer, I want you to notice, I want you to think about what would your response be? You know, if somebody came and said, you know what, you, you need to stop preaching this, this message about Jesus. You know, what, what would our response be? We start to, to, to plan and to scheme and to strategize. You know, will we, will, will we see, well, what kind of political, um, you know, contacts might we have that can help us do an end around around this? Um, you know, are there, uh, are there powers or, or things that we can appeal to? Uh, you know, we, we would start, we, you know, uh, a lot of us are fixers. <laughs> so we want to try to start fixing the problem. But they turned first to prayer before they went to fixing anything. 
And we see in their prayer uh, that they prayed fervently. They prayed fervently, but uh, I, I want you to see what, what they prayed. Verse 24. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. They acknowledge that God is all powerful. He's the sovereign creator. Verse 25, you spoke by your Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. You see, they, they first acknowledged that God is all powerful and all sovereign. And then uh, and then they quoted Psalm chapter two. When the pressure was on, when life shook them, scripture came out and they prayed Psalm two back to the Lord and said, you know what? The people's indeed uh, plot in vain. And these, these officials that are plotting against Jesus, they're plotting in vain. Lord, we know that we see that we recognize that. Verse 28, they did what your power and will had decided beforehand what should happen. They did what your power and will decided beforehand. What should happen? Can you imagine that? They, they're recognizing that, that this is, is coming through your hand, Lord. That this is not a surprise to you. There's no oops going up in heaven. There's no uh-oh going up in heaven because you, you're, this is your will, Lord. And so they spend the first five verses of this prayer uh, pointing in an upward direction. The, the orientation of the prayer is upward to the sovereignness of God, praying God's word back to God and recognizing that God is in power. God is in control. And this is all part of his plan. And then watch how their verse, how, how the prayer turns from upward to inward. Verse 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Verse 30, it goes from inward to outward. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonder through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, it says the place where they were meeting was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. The church prayed fervently. And there's two things I really want you to, to see about this prayer. And the first thing that, that I want you to see uh, about this prayer is that uh, it, it's a decision that they made. And the decision that they made before they prayed this prayer, the, the prayer reflects this decision that they made. They decided that Jesus doesn't need a makeover. Can, can you imagine uh, being in their, their circumstance and situation? Peter and John come back and you know what? They might say, well, you know what? Well, maybe, maybe we need to soften our stance on Jesus. Maybe we need to tweak the message a little bit. Maybe we need to, to maybe Peter, you need to quit pointing your finger at people and say uh, the Jesus that you all killed, that you all crucified has been ri risen from the dead, has been raised by the dead from God. But they didn't decide that Jesus needed a makeover. It is evident in their prayer that, that, that they did not go that route. I don't know if you remember uh, several years ago, there, there used to be some, some TV shows uh, about makeovers. One of them was called Extreme Makeover. Another one was called What Not to Wear. But basically, uh, they got a person that... You know, whose, whose friends were like, you know, our, our friend just needs a makeover. They need a style update. So they would get this unkempt, un, unstylish person and kind of get a, a before picture. Then they bring in these professionals. They would give them a new haircut. They would take them to buy uh, clothes that, that would, you know, uh, would work best for them. Uh, for some of the, the ladies, they decided to uh, bring in makeup artists. And so they, they spend this hour long show showing the, you the transformation, the extreme makeover from from starting point A to point B. But the early church looked at who Jesus was and they decided, you know what? Jesus doesn't need a makeover. Jesus doesn't need a new haircut. 
Jesus doesn't need a new wardrobe. Jesus doesn't need some Botox shots. Jesus is just fine the way he is. And in our world today, we're going to be tempted. We're going to be pressured to tweak who Jesus is. We're going to be tempted. We're going to be pressured to tweak the message about Jesus to fit into our world. There may be people that look at uh, uh, what Jesus taught. They may, may, there may be people that look at Jesus and say, you know what? If you just tweak this little thing about Jesus, it'd be a lot more palatable. Or if you tweak this other thing about Jesus, then a lot more people would be accepting of your message. But Jesus didn't need to be updated or didn't need a makeover then. And he certainly doesn't need a makeover now. And that is reflected in their prayer and that is reflected in the message and the lives that they continued to live. When the pressure is on, we've got a choice to make. And one of those choices we have to make is the choice that, you know what? Jesus doesn't need a makeover. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the only one who went to a cross and laid down his life for your sin and my sin. And through his work on the cross, he offers us a pardon before a holy God. He offers us a home in heaven. He, open, he, he offers us a, a promise of a future where there's no more tears, no more crying, no more pain, where everything is made right. And then he followed up his work on the cross by, by raising from the dead, proving he was who he said he was. Jesus is just fine. He doesn't need a makeover. Second thing about this prayer I want you uh, to, to, to recognize is this. Verse 29 is just incredible. Again, they spend five verses with an upward orientation to God, and then they turn inward. Now, this is backwards for, uh, you know, just the human nature, because our human nature is to first turn inward and say, OK, God, fix this. OK, God, fix that. God, do this for me. God, do that for me. But they first oriented their prayers to who uh, God was and how great and mighty he was. But look at how they pray for themselves. Verse 29, now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Do you notice what they don't pray for? They don't pray for their enemies to be destroyed. They don't pray for the system to be bent to their will. They don't pray for the problem to be removed. They pray that they would be faithful. That they would be bold. That they would be strong. And that in the midst of the circumstance that's uncomfortable, in the midst of the pressure that they are facing, in the midst of circumstances that they never would have wished upon themselves, they don't pray for God to fix everything. They pray for strength and boldness and courage to, to stay faithful to Jesus. There's a lot we can learn from that kind of prayer. There's a lot we can learn from that kind of prayer. They didn't demand their rights. They didn't plot for a political advantage. They simply turned to the Lord and asked the Lord to help them be faithful. What our nation is looking for, what our nation needs, what our community needs, what our households need, we all need Jesus. So God, help us to be faithful. Oh God, strengthen us for these moments. God, help us not to shrink back from the circumstances that are around us that are uncomfortable. Lord, we, we don't want to go running after a new Savior. We don't want to update who Jesus is. He is our hope. He is our strength. And He is our peace. When the pressure is on, we need to be reminded, Jesus is enough. When the pressure is on, we need to pray that the Lord would make us faithful. 
The church is called to be a light. The church is called to be salt. The church is called to share the hope of Jesus. The church is called to pray. When the pressure is on, Lord, make us faithful. Lord, make us faithful. Lord, make us faithful. As we close today, I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit different. I'm going to close in prayer. Now I'm just going to ask you to, to spend a, a few moments. It may be a couple minutes. It may turn into 20 minutes. It may turn into an hour. But I'm just going to ask you to pray. If there's a people that is called to pray, surely it is us. If there's a people that is called to stand before the throne of God, lifting up our broken world, our broken nation, our broken community, or maybe even our broken home, Lord, it's got to be us. So I'm going to ask you just to spend a couple minutes today just praying for your country. Pray that God would bring peace. Pray that God would bring healing. But pray most of all that, that the name of Jesus would be known and lifted high. Because he is our only hope. So pray that, that we, the church, would fearlessly share the message. And pray that we, the church, would continue lifting up our nation, our community, and our households in prayer. Would you do that today? Let's close in prayer. Jesus, thank you for, uh, for who you are. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. There is no name greater than your name. So, King Jesus, we, we bow before you again today. Lord, we pray that you would bring healing to our land. We pray that you bring healing to our communities. God, that you may even bring healing into our homes today. We desperately need you. There's no, other, there's no other place for us to go but to you. So, Lord, we turn to you and ask that you would do incredible, miraculous, and powerful things in our world. Lord, we pray that you give us boldness. God, that you give us courage. Uh, Lord, that you would help us not to shrink back when the pressure is on. But to continue to hope in you, continue to have confidence in you, because you are enough. And we trust you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. This time of year, the big thing to celebrate is freedom. It's 4th of July weekend, Independence Day. It's a big thing that we celebrate for our country. It's the freedom our country has had. And this year, with 4th of July weekend, it's got me thinking a little bit more about not just the freedom of our country, but the freedom we can have in Christ, and the freedom that we do have in Christ. And the best part about the freedom in Christ that we have is that we don't have to wait necessarily once a year to celebrate that, but that is something we can celebrate each and every day, and we get to each and every week together as we take communion. Because it's through the sacrifice on the cross of him raising from the dead that we can have this freedom that scripture talks about. And not only that, but this morning as we come together and take this communion and partake in the bread and the juice, let us think also, again, of that freedom that we can have. The freedom that helps us know that one day we're going to be away from all the pain and the suffering in this world. The freedom to know that all the wrongdoing that I've done and I've had in my life has been forgiven and taken away because of the relationship I have with Jesus Christ. That freedom that no one or nothing can bring. That freedom in Christ through the sacrifice all those years ago on the cross. So again, let's just remember that this freedom in Christ is different than the freedom that we got to celebrate this weekend of 4th of July. Because 4th of July has come and gone. It's the day after. And yes, we talk about the freedom, but we don't necessarily celebrate it like we do on the 4th of July. But it's another day this morning and that means it's another day for us to remember and celebrate that freedom that we have through Jesus Christ. So again, as we partake in the communion this morning, let us remember and focus on that freedom together. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for freedom. We thank you that the freedom we have in you is a freedom that we can celebrate each and every day. And we don't have to wait for a specific day of the year for us to go and spend specific time to celebrate that. But it's something that every single morning when we wake up, we get to wake up knowing that if we have the relationship with you, we are free. We are forgiven and we get to celebrate that and live that so much each and every day. So I pray as we come together this morning and partake in communion, pray as we remember your body that was broken and the blood that was shed, that it's through that, through that sacrifice, that you get to have this freedom in you. We thank you for that sacrifice, and we love you each and every day. In your prayer, amen.
can do to help you follow him more closely, or if you just have a, a prayer request, uh, we would love to be able to um, just share uh, and to pray with you and just to walk alongside you and what you've got going on in your life. So feel free to reach out to us. We hope that you have a great week and we'll, we'll see you next time. Take care.